Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. This is Ukraine War News Update, first part thereof for the 20th of June 2024. Let's go straight to where we normally start, Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before. All the usual caveats apply, you can find them in the description to the video below. We have 1,170 personnel lost, that's about where we have seen it for the last month, I guess. Three tanks, um, definitely lower than we have seen, but we had two days of zero and then two tanks lost, and then it ticked up for a couple of days, and now it's gone back down to three. 18 armoured personnel vehicles lost, 45 artillery systems. Remember, artillery systems probably include heavy mortars as well, heavy mortar positions. Um, one multiple launch rocket system and two anti-aircraft warfare systems. That's going to be good news there. 56 vehicles and fuel tanks and six pieces of special equipment. So... Fairly heavy in artillery, in terms of artillery and personnel lost. Uh, other categories, there or thereabouts, some lower ones there, tanks. Uh, 56 vehicles and fuel tanks is obviously going to hurt. So that's a situation. Uh, I just want to bring this uh, question to the fore. Actually, wrong question. It's this question. No, it's the other question. Uh, get it right, Pierce. So uh, the one thing I'm asking myself is I hear the Russian losses are not sustainable. I think he said that almost every single day the last year or more. Yeah, I see no sign of it. Uh, is it possible to do a more in-depth in item on this? Because the Russians seem not to be bothered with unsustainable. Is it possible that they have more reserves than anyone had guessed? They repair, produce way more than people think. I might spend a few hours on it and the numbers are overwhelming, but there is also no slowing down, it seems to me. Okay, good question. Like I have said, unsustainable. What does that mean? Because we keep seeing these huge figures. Now, it is unsustainable and we can see that. So by unsustainable, I mean you, I mean, you can't keep doing this uh, and expect to be in the same kind of situation. So there's a few... A few data points to look at to see whether they have been able to sustain the sorts of attacks they were doing at the beginning of the war. So at the beginning of the war, they were attacking with maybe 60, 30, 60 vehicles at, at one time. And now we've moved down to one, three, five. I can show you a bunch of footage I've looked at this morning of Russian attacks that have been repelled. And there have been twos and threes, twos and threes vehicles. Over the last week, we saw a couple of attacks with about 16, 19 vehicles, and they stuck out like a sore thumb because they haven't done that since October. Like last time they attacked with that many vehicles was attacking uh, Avdivka. So we can look at the behavior of the Russians and say it appears that they are not doing what they were doing at the beginning of the war. In other words, what they were doing at the beginning of the war, they were not able to sustain. Okay, so literally, when I say the, this is unsustainable, it has resulted in a behavior which is different now than it was before. We can look at the personnel loss and say, okay, they've reconstituted their 155th Naval Infantry Brigade nine times, right? And, and that's led to forced dilution. They can't sustain these losses without changes to behavior, changes to performance. Now, this is not to say that, that Ukraine don't have similar problems, okay? So just forget Ukraine. I've been saying this about Russia. So the Russian... Forces have been diluted as a force quality issue, and you could argue a force quantity issue as well. Um, we have seen equipment that has has been uh, drafted in from stock stockpiles. The Russians have had huge, huge stockpiles, and so when I say it's unsustainable, they can't keep um, sending new tanks, shiny, good quality uh, tanks that that are full brim full of uh, of fire control systems and optics at the, at the top level. They are refurbishing old T family tanks. They've even got T-55s and T-54s. They've got T-62s and T-64s. They are refurbishing rather than producing new tanks. They are getting stuff out of deep storage and you are seeing D-10s, D-20s and D-30s howitzers on, uh, on the front line. Those are those are 70 year old bits of kit. We saw a scout card the other day that was 60 years old. We are seeing uh, a, a complete change of the military vehicle um, provision that the the Russian army has. So so that's that's another data point. Uh, with regard to personnel, we are seeing 
Uh, people, instead of having Russian contract soldiers, we are getting mobilized people. We're getting people from all around the world. We're getting convicts and they've gone through, cycled through the convicts. They can't sustain that. They've run out of, of enough convicts to be able to do what they were doing at the height of what they're doing in Bakhmut. So they're cycling to different mem different parts of the population in order to do these things. They're starting to take people off the streets a little bit more in Russia. So th there are changes in behavior. Now, yes, there are still people. There are still raw people, but it, it's about the type of people and how Russia are going out doing, doing this. And then you have to wonder you know, how long before th that becomes... Uh, a much more fundamental issue. So I think in less the people front, but the but the equipment front, we are moving into a period where Russia are in, in an awful lot of trouble, I think. So when we look at the loss list, this is from a couple of days ago, but I found this interesting. So again, this is an indication how uh, as to how the Russian losses have been unsustainable. When we look at the losses and we look at all of these vehicles here are civilian vehicles. So straight away, you have a category that you wouldn't have seen at the beginning of the war. And now you have that category that is taking up probably uh, two-fifths of that the daily losses. Two-fifths of the daily losses of the Russian uh, equipment losses are civilian vehicles. This is unsustainable. This is what you get. It, you can't sustain losing those... Uh, a mechanized piece of mechanized military kit so you are having to now use civilian kit and within that we can we can point out another couple of, of things here so you've got motorcycles just a phenomenal amount of motorcycles the the losses were unsustainable so now they're having to use motorcycles we are seeing Bukanka scooby-doo vans being used uh their ten a penny go up a little bit and look at this is probably a, a tenth of their losses are all-terrain vehicles, golf buggies. They couldn't sustain the losses of infantry fighting vehicles to the point they had to get a 1,000 golf buggies, golf carts from China. We are seeing quad bikes. Okay, then when we go up, we can see MTLBs. We're, we're hearing that their stockpiles of those have run out pretty much in Russia. We can see a number of other vehicles on the list often that indicate that things aren't looking good. D30 howitzers, as mentioned before, tracked garden sheds are being used because of necessity. They have run out of the more adequate vehicles to use. They are adapting tanks to be used, not as tanks. Things are not going well. This is what unsustainable looks like. We are in the period of the evidence being shown for this being unsustainable. And just before we actually look at today's loss list, let's, let's add another couple of data points into how the losses have been unsustainable. So what we heard yesterday is Russia has moved the vast majority of its ground forces previously stationed near Finland to the war in Ukraine. Now, that is apparently 80% of its equipment and manpower. So if you remember, when Finland joined NATO, Russia countered that with, well, we're going to increase our military presence near the border. We're going to build up a brand new military district and so on and so forth. And a mere number of months later, they've not only not done that, they've actually taken 80% of their military provision from the, U from the Finnish border and taken that to the front lines in Ukraine because the losses have been unsustainable. We have also heard that 15 uh, air defence systems have been taken out in just over the last month, or over the last month. Russia is running out of those air defences, so that is an unsustainable set of losses. How do we know that? They brought two, the last S-300 systems from Japan's Kuril Islands have just been moved to Crimea. So two systems that sit out on the very easternmost edge of the Russian Federation on these disputed islands north of Japan. That they keep those there to stop the Japanese prowling. They brought them to Crimea. Why? Because they've taken unsustainable losses. They have moved their S-500 from Russia, from, no, from Russia, from Moscow area. 
That's their best air defense system. That's a prototype single air defense system. They brought that supposedly to Crimea. That is evidence of an un, uh, of unsustainable losses. And here we have a Russian train seen yesterday, I believe, with mostly old equipment traveling towards Ukraine. Ukraine needs to be allowed to strike deep within to, into Russia to hit these sort of trains and warehouses. Absolutely, where the equipment is unloaded. Absolutely, but bear in mind that this is mainly old equipment brought out from deep storage. Again, this, I think, indicates unsustainable losses. So it's a really good question because I do use that, that term a lot and I don't really define it closely enough. Um, but it's definitely something to worth thinking about. Now, even though Russia continue to lose stuff and people, it's you need to look at what the stuff is and who the people are. And there are different ways of looking at unsustainable. Yes, you can sustain losses, but you can't sustain the types of uh, losses or, or the, you can't sustain the type of behaviour uh, with the with the type of equipment and people that you were using back from uh, a year and a half ago that that's my case I ho hopefully that that makes sense so you know every day I do say they are unsustainable and then I give you evidence that they have not been able to sustain uh, their efforts let's look at today's losses and you can see that it's about uh, two to one I think he actually uh, Andrew adds it up here 61 russian losses 33 ukrainian so it's about a two to one uh, ideally i say intuitively russia uh, ukraine could do with a three to one loss ratio of russian to ukrainian vehicles uh, of which 18 russian combat vehicles uh, eight destroyed two abandoned and eight damaged and 12 uh, ukrainian combat vehicles so actually when you look at the combat vehicles the ukrainians have lost uh, closer to parity there 12 to 18 i mean not not it's a little bit further away but still you know uh not as good as we would like seeing right we are yet again seeing a uh, quite a few western pieces of kit as i keep saying uh luckily for most of the combat equipment the ukrainians have had theirs damaged one abandoned uh that tank an unknown tank uh so, but otherwise most of it damaged which is better uh, we do have a number of pieces of surveillance and comms equipment. We've got an engineering vehicle, an unknown sort, unmanned ground vehicle destroyed. Uh, that's a that's a ground drone. Some howitzers, uh, a tank, unknown tank as mentioned, and a couple of Bradleys, M113, Max Pro, mine resistant ambush protection vehicle, Kozak 7, and then a load of destroyed pickup vehicles, uh, a couple of decoys at the bottom, a few trees have been hit by lancets, uh, got old good old Ukrainian trees they do a good defensive job um, and then we go to the Russian losses and we can see that there's a higher proportion of destroyed equipment in the combat losses uh, quite a lot of Ukrainian civilian vehicles were destroyed uh, same with the Russians they've got a fairly heavy civilian and ATV destroyed losses there we'll go to the top of the list and it's mainly surveillance and comms equipment at the top um, nothing incredibly high value. Um, enge engineering vehicle excavator, uh, probably digging trenches there. Um, we have a few tanks and a few artillery pieces. Nothing uh, to shout about particularly. Some BMP 1s and 2s, infantry fighting vehicles. Usual MTLBs listed there. You just wonder how long they can keep losing MTLBs before. I mean, I think they are running out of MTLBs, which is why they're using these other vehicles. Uh, but they're still, I mean, they had a lot of them, uh, right, MTLBs. But uh, by all accounts, you, you'd start to see them struggle to use as many MTL, MTLBs as they were, given the stockpiles have supposedly run dry. Uh, trucks and civilian vehicles, golf, uh, golf carts, uh, quads, all sorts of um, civilian vehicles there lost. So a lot of Russian equipment. Nothing of particularly high value actually for either side there. Uh, so we'll we'll move on. But um, yeah, high losses. Right, uh, I've I've gone through, I cycled through that stuff. Oh, and just another data point actually, which I, I think is worth noting. So when, when we say these are unsustained losses, there are other ways you can measure the fact that Russia or the claim that Russia can't sustain these losses. 
In Irkutsk, councillors stopped repairs to schools until 2025. Despite the urgent need in some cases, the local government followed the Kremlin doctrine that all funds must go to the war. Oh, and to public sector employees. So they can't sustain those losses to the point that they are taking money away from education. They are, they are unable to repair schools in Irkutsk because that money needs to go to the war effort. That's what unsustainable losses look like. It's not just that they're suddenly one day going to run out of tanks and have zero tanks. What you'll find is they'll use fewer and fewer tanks. They'll adapt tanks or use broken tanks in like track garden sheds or whatever. Uh, they'll use them in different ways. They'll get the tanks that they're getting built from new are often refurbished, poorly upgraded, as in not with the required components they would like because of sanctions, um, so on and so forth. Uh, but, but in order to even do that, they're having to pull money away from different sectors of the uh, the economy and society it is as mentioned unsustainable um but great question uh so i was talking about drones and how ukraine you know we can look at the touchney stats that that daniela and uh, erland and others have been working so hard on well of course andrew himself his statistics or his data sets um and and I've said for a long time that that it appears that Ukraine had the drone advantage in sort of FPV drones and drone uh, drones that drop IEDs and whatnot. Someone commented yesterday that Willie OAM, who's who's a YouTube channel, did an interview the other day with a guy who's been fighting there. He was home for six months from last September to mid spring. He said when he got back, the drone thing had grown exponentially for Ukraine. He didn't believe there could be that many drones in existence. Said everywhere you are now, it's a steady stream of drones headed to the Russian lines. Last year, he'd only seen a few a day. Now it's too many to count. I know it's an anecdote, but you, it fits in with everything else that we are that we're hearing about what's going on and seeing about what's going on uh, on the front lines and and Ukraine really need to keep that asymmetrical advantage um, going because uh, it is it is an area that they are able to get a great advantage over the Russians. Now there was uh, quite a loss yesterday. I'm not putting this in strikes. It looks like a random explosion of a Russian uh, vehicle that might have just detonated itself. Bang! I mean, that's a, that's a huge explosion. Reported a big explosion in Pervomysk, Luhansk region, 30 kilometers from the front line. It turned out to be a Russian track truck with ammunition. It might have been hit 30 what well, 30 kilometers. I mean, you could have a drone that does that. They are really pushing those drones to um, to these ranges these days. But basically, the truck appears to have vaporized, uh, leaving a crater and uh, the trees and the local local um, and and the road here doesn't seem to be don't seem to be in very good uh, nick after that catastrophic explosion there. Right, moving on to distance strikes, standoff munitions, etc. Uh, Russia did attack Ukraine again last night. Uh, they're fairly consistent just now with the sort of waves of 20 odd drones, not the huge, overwhelming saturation attacks that we had seen earlier in the war. They seem to just be hitting with, I don't know, a level of drones. I. I would I would just wait another couple of days and wait till you got fifty and do fifty. I, I just, yeah I don't know. Anyway, Russia attacked Ukraine with a mix of missiles and drones overnight. The Ukrainians shot down four out of four KH one hundred one KH five hundred five cruise missiles. Uh, twenty seven out of twenty seven Shahid drones. So one hundred percent in those categories. One out of two of the KH fifty nine cruise missiles. That's slightly uh, more problematic. And then zero out of three Iskander M ballistic missiles. And that's uh, not too surprising. It's more difficult to shoot down those ballistic missiles unless you've got a uh, SAMT or Patriot system right near them. And they appear to have gone straight for Dnipro. I don't know whether that's a power plant they've gone for there. Uh, but as for the drones, you can see they were going for Kiev last night uh, and then a few further to the south of Kiev. I don't know exactly where. We had um, one of the KH-59 going for Dnipro, another one, uh, somewhere else near near um, Zaporizhia Reservoir by the looks of it. 
and some other drones flying around uh, here and there. But uh, I don't know of any of the damage done to Ukraine last night. Obviously, there's quite a lot of there's good interception of a lot of those munitions, which is great news for the Ukrainians. They will still cause damage as they fall, but don't know about these successful missile strikes. Right, Russian telegram channels report drone attacks last night on several oil refineries in Russia. So Ukraine have had definitely more tangible success by the looks of it. A fire broke out on an oil depot in the Tambov region of Russia. Governor wrote about a pop and a fire. Eyewitnesses said that they heard a loud explosion and a tank caught fire. The Af Fipsky oil refinery in Krasnodar region and an oil depot in the neighboring village of NM in the Republic of Ajia uh, were also attacked. So we have possibly three strikes. So this is Tambov still on fire, major fire there at an oil depot. Uh, and then the, the, the nocturnal sort of sounds of explosions and evidence of all three of these actually. So as mentioned, you've got a, a Fipsky that's located 20 kilometers from Krasnodar. I think I've got I've got maps in a second. In the neighboring Agia, uh, far at the Lukol Yaf Yug Neft Neftoproduct oil depot in the village of NM, after debris from one of the downed drones crashed into a tank. Uh, and alert, I don't know whether that's what actually happened or whether that's how the Russians say, yeah, we succeeded, we shot it down. But we shot it down into the target it was going for. Oh, how convenient. Or did it just succeed? An alert due to drone attacks this night was declared in Lipetsk, Belgorod, Kursk and Voronezh region. So there are other places where drones were active and we don't know the outcome there. So a couple of these. Here's the one. I presume that's Krasnodar region there. And, uh, you know, fairly substantial fires. And this one is the one up into... NM, uh, or is that the one in Tambov? That's Tambov uh, or Blast, but I, I, yeah, I'm not 100% sure uh, either way, but you get a sense of where some of these were taking place. Now, also yesterday, and I reported this in, I think, my Frontline update maybe, but a, the strike on at the Azov Oil Depot was reignited, not by any attack. I think the fire just broke out again, and it wasn't good for Azov. So unfortunately, it's not possible to stabilize the situation, says this Russian source at the oil depot in Azov, where the day before a fire broke out as a result of a drone attack. The fire has not, still not been extinguished. At 4.40, the second tank depressurized. Emergency situations ministry specialists continue to work to extinguish the fire. Kiev regime is destroying Russia's economic potential. Exactly, and it is. And actually, you know, there is more, says Max24. Bad news from Azov. The fire spread to the second tank. Firefighters pour foam non-stop, but it doesn't help. We saved on our air defense. Now we're cleaning up. Um, and that's 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 it. If you don't spend money on air defense, and this goes through for Ukraine as well, it, in, in terms of our support of Ukraine. Like we said... We said at the reconstruction um, conference that uh, the recovery conference in Berlin, oh, yeah, we'll give you 50 billion euros to reconstruct these destroyed areas instead of the 10 billion we could have given a year earlier for air defense. So, you know, you save on air defense, you pay more on the back end. Uh, and, uh, so this is the oil depot there in Azov that is still burning. You've got um, a hole in another tank you've got um damage to a third tank by the looks of it and then the second tank has been depressurized and possibly on fire so yeah yesterday there was uh there were fir fir there was firm's data at Henichesk airport which is at the top of Crimea and I presume um who knows but an air defense system might have been hit there there's I've not heard anything on that since these kind of details often filter out uh, a few days later, but Krimsky Veter Monitoring Group reports a strong fire in the area of Henichesk Airport. Um, and uh, yeah, I doubt that's just a random bushfire. A strong fire was also visible and occupied Oleshki, so that's down. You've got the Oleshki Sands sort of behind Krinky actually on the Dnipro River, big sort of sandy area, uh, dunes and whatnot. Uh, there was a strong fire visible there in, uh, there's also the t town of Oleshki. Telegram channel stated the fires followed explosives being dropped. At least one seems to be in a private house. Um, I, could well be ammunition being stored 
uh, and whatnot uh, as uh, the yeah some serious fires there and then this morning cape chowder in crimea lots of ambulances and an explosion is heard according to local residents don't know what's going on there but um yeah it, who knows there there's some kind of uh, target one would imagine google maps shows this is this a typical farm or does it look like something military um i would say i don't know these kind of cape areas near to the sea you would expect there to be air defenses radars give you gr good uh, visuals over the uh, over the flat sea um so yeah my guess is something has been struck there okay this this is kind of bizarre for a number of reasons moving on to other bits and pieces now so a war translated video here posts he's posted russian bloggers well he says that russian bloggers are panicking and and because of a maybe not a throwaway statement but a maybe an incredibly important statement for their new Minister of Defence, Bulosov. So he's visited a military camp at the 155th Banzai Brigade, uh, I presume that's 155th Naval Infantry Brigade, which is under reconstruction, uh, and said that the new barracks project must be completed on time because people, quote, will soon start returning, whatever this means. And that may have got people in a bit of a panic because you're thinking about bringing your troops back home. Now, here is not just what he says there, but also how he's speaking to some of these people. It's quite interesting. Training complex for physical, physical exercise, says your man. Okay, are all contracts signed? We have one contract for the first stage. Um, as I understand, all of this is the first stage, says Bulosov. All of this we have the financing for. Uh, yes. You take this under your personal responsibility. You will monthly report to me about the number of people and don't even think of not delivering on time. I just find this really bizarre that that you've got this on camera and you've got like if if, my, if our ministry of whatever, if our defence minister or economics minister or whatever was on camera like holding people to account i mean i'm not saying it's wrong to hold people to account but it's not the sort of thing you do in public at a tv event because it it assumes that you don't normally do that and it assumes that like this time i want everything to happen as as per like my my orders and if you don't there's going to be criminal responsibility so it's just really weird don't even think of not delivering on time he says uh, we understand the social responsibility. No, it will be your criminal responsibility, just in case. Wow. So it's like, if you don't get this done on time, yeah, we under understand that we our social responsibility to get this done on time. No, 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 mate. It's your criminal responsibility. If you don't get it done on time, you'll be in prison. And he's saying this bit on public on TV. I, I just find it quite fascinating. Uh, like I always say, like concentrate on the little things. Uh, the first stage must be done uh, depending on uh, contractor, uh, says Belosov. First stage must be done depending on contractor. The deadlines can't move. The people will start returning. Everything must be ready. And it's that last bit that, that's significant there. The people will start returning. Yeah, so it must be uh, 155th Naval Infantry Brigade. Um, there, you've got an anchor there, so Marines. Um, wow. I don't know what to make of that. I don't know whether that... There's dodgy translation, or I presume not. I presume this is war translated doing it. Uh, everything must everything must be ready. The people will start returning. Mm. Um, now, uh, I can't show you uh, th this video. We've got another war crime caught on drone footage where Russians have uh, killed, shot four Ukrainian prisoners. The GUI has actually identified the four Russians that, that did this. Um and has named them here in fact uh, lots of details on that uh here 
So war criminals of the Russian Federation, GUI, identified the killers of four Ukrainian prisoners of war. In the second half of May 2024, near the village of Robotne in the Zaporizhia region, military personnel of the aggressor state of Russia committed another war crime. They shot Ukrainian prisoners of war. Uh, the episode of the execution was captured on video. Four Ukrainian servicemen with their hands raised without weapons surrendered. The Russians forced them to lie face down and shot them at close range. Specialists of the GUI, the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine, identified those involved in war crime. They turned out to be Russian invaders who were part of the assault group of the 70th Motorized Rifle Regiment and the 42nd Motorized Rifle Division of the 50th, 58th Army of the Southern District of the Russian Federation. Okay, and then they go through and they can actually work out exactly who those people were who were responsible. Uh, the specified Russian war criminals may also be involved in the murder of several more Ukrainian prisoners of war uh, later in May 2024. This is this in particular is evidenced by the received radio intercepts of the conversation of the occupiers of the 70th Regiment of the Russian Armed Forces during which one of the Russian commanders of the assault company orders his subordinates to shoot Ukrainian soldiers. Okay, this is also on top of... So the other day, a decapitated... Ukrainian soldier was found on top of something like an infantry fighting vehicle or something. And there have been these claims that the Russian commanders are telling their soldiers not to take Ukrainian prisoners, but to execute them and execute them as horrifically as possible type thing. And uh, uh, Ukraine, the latest podcast reports on this yesterday. It is, this is a really serious, obviously, infringement of... Um, the the rules of law uh, the rules of war and uh it just shows that the russians are continuing to be war criminals they 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 were at the beginning of the war they were in the middle of the war and they are now just yeah i don't know what else i can say um right finally we'll, get, we'll say um this is interesting this Ukraine has restored ferry service to Georgia across the Black Sea. So you've got the Black Sea. You've got the grain corridor that goes right down the coastline of sort of Romania uh, and uh, is it Bulgaria? Down that coastline before it gets down to the Bosphorus Straits. I think they're using that corridor. So it's, it's going to be a really inefficient way. They're, I don't think they're going to go straight across the Black Sea. But they're restoring a ferry service to Georgia that was suspended during the, the Russian invasion. Uh, the first voyage from Chornomorsk, a desert oblast, to Batumi in Georgia is set for the 9th of July. Goodness me, I wouldn't like to be the first one trying that out. Well, actually, Exit has a rundown of this. Let's see if I've got... Uh, there's a Black Sea... No, sometimes is a Black Sea image. There's a few uh, weather ones there. Okay, well, we'll, we'll just... You, you can imagine what it looks like right the rundown she says ukraine will restore passenger ferry service to georgia relying on the ukraine uh, grain corridor routes for much much of the journey beginning on july the 9th why is this a big deal so it means that they believe that the the ukrainian corridor is so secure that they can take entire ships of people through it's another step towards Ukrainian port operations returning to mostly normal service. And thirdly, it further opens up the ability for trade, commerce and tourism with Ukraine's Black Sea neighbours. It's really actually more significant than you might think. Why did Ukraine choose Georgia first? The recent tumultuous vote in Georgia was likely a good thing for this deal. As the Georgian government is clearly Russian-leaning, it's likely that ships transiting there will be safer because Russia will not want to start a fight with a government that just went through half hell, hell to support them. My guess is that the first ferry will leave from Georgia bound for Odessa, and once you set a precedent by getting one ship through, we already know that others will follow. Um... Uh, do you know what happens after you get ferry service up and running smoothly for six months? It serves as an example that may well inspire attempts at re-establishing establishing other types of pas passenger transport that have been shut down since the beginning of the full-scale invasion. And there's a, um, an, a motorcon or whatever little um, image of a plane. And uh, that... I think is is interesting because there has been a lot of talk about opening up airports in Ukraine. The talk about the um, they did a test flight into the Kiev airport. I don't think it'd be Kiev. I think that would be too dangerous. Surely it'd be something like Lviv, where you're only in Ukrainian airspace for a short while, 
uh, to land in the, in the west of Kiev. I think that would be super important. I don't know if there are too many risks involved in that, but it's certainly something that, that Ukraine will be looking into. Anyway, that's enough from me. Really appreciate your support. Thank you for watching. Take care and I'll speak to you soon.